Hi everyone, my name is Memo and I am so glad that you are worshiping with our online community today. There is something at our church for children, young adults, grandparents, and everyone in between. So follow our social media, subscribe to our YouTube, and check out our website to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. We will continue our preaching series, Jesus on Every Page, with a study on the book of Esther. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on at Purpose Church. Summer is coming, and that means our favorite weeks of the year are here. That's right, it's time for camp. Registration for both our Purpose Kids Camp and Student Ministry Summer Camp opens today. At Stellar Purpose Kids Camp, children aged four through fifth grade will be led by amazing leaders to discover how to see evidence of God in everyday life and shine like Jesus. Your children will participate in missions projects, hear Bible stories, play games, and enjoy snacks in this awesome day camp. Students in 6th through 12th grade are invited to an unforgettable, life-changing experience with Jesus at Forest Home. Stay in awesome cabins, enjoy delicious food, have fun on the lake, connect with God and with others during the six-day, five-night-away camp. Space is limited, so secure your spot today. Don't miss out on these amazing opportunities for your children to grow in the Lord. Register for Purpose Kids Camp or Student Ministry Summer Camp at PurposeChurch.com camp. Remember, scholarship applications and early bird registration ends May 14th. If you are a young adult ages 18 to 35, we have some fun-filled evenings planned for you. On Sunday, April 2nd, bring your friends and come to a night of cosmic bowling at Chaparral Lanes in San Dimas. The cost is $15 for two hours of bowling and shoe rental. Register at PurposeChurch.com slash young adult to join in on the action. And if you can't make it to bowling, we have our regular on-campus young adult nights on April 13th and April 27th. We hope to see lots of you there. Are you ready to take the next step in your faith journey by being baptized on Easter Sunday? Whether you're an adult, student, or child, we welcome you to our baptism class on Wednesday, April 5th at 7 p.m. in room H100. Attending this class is not required, but highly encouraged so that you can meet with a pastor, ask any questions, and get pre-registered for Easter baptism. Child care is provided for those under five. And if you have any questions, just email info at purposechurch.com. Then, on Friday, April 7th at 7 p.m. is our special Good Friday worship service. Let's gather together as a church family to contemplate the love of God and the sacrifice that Jesus made on that very first Good Friday through music, drama, message, and communion. Easter is also the perfect time to invite our friends and family to our church and hear the good news of Jesus. To help you connect with your oikos, which is the eight to 15 people of your sphere of influence, we have invitations, bumper stickers, lawn signs, and online shareables. To get a hold of all of these, follow our Instagram at Purpose Pomona, or come to any one of our Sunday services on campus, and our Connect team would love to equip you with all that you need. We need hundreds of volunteers to serve the thousands of guests that will visit our campus this Easter season. To sign up for any of our volunteer opportunities and for the most up-to-date information about our Easter celebration, visit PurposeChurch.com Easter. I can't wait to see you on April 9th. There are many other ways you can partner with Purpose Church to further God's kingdom. To find these opportunities or to give online, go to PurposeChurch.com give. Let's pray before we continue to worship together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for another day of life, Lord, another day to celebrate just the awesome gifts that you have given us, Lord. Lord, I ask that your word continue to go forth, God, that it would not return void, Lord, as we prepare, God, for that Good Friday service, Lord, and for Easter Sunday, Lord, that you would just bless those, Lord, with a desire to serve, with a desire to reach others, God, and a desire to bring others to you, Lord. Let your will be done, God, and I pray that your Holy Spirit dwell within us. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray, amen. This is the good news. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Yeah. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table. 
Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen. Hey, Purpose Church, my name is Claire, and I have the joy of serving as our high school associate pastor here at Purpose Church. And I am so honored to be here together, opening up God's word for our series, Jesus on Every Page, where here at Purpose Church, we are walking through every book of the Bible for the entire year of 2023. And we have come to the end of the historical section of the Old Testament, and we have landed in the book of Esther. Now, Esther is a shorter book of the Bible. It only takes about 30 minutes to read, but it's quite important because Esther helped to establish and was read aloud every year at the Festival of Purim, which is celebrated annually by the Jews. But something that's really interesting about the book of Esther is that there is actually no direct mention of God in the original text. So how did this little book that doesn't mention God directly, how did it become known to be scripture, canonized into our Bibles like Pastor Eric talked about last week? What about this story is so important? Well, in order to find out, we need to dive into the story. And during our time together, we'll be able to go through most of it. So buckle up, because this author, who's anonymous, is a masterful storyteller. So open up your Bibles with me to Esther chapter 1, verse 1, where scripture says, This is what happened during the time of Xerxes, the Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. Now here, the author is orienting us to the context of this story. Now remember, this is post-exile of the Jewish people. We've been studying together that the northern kingdom of Israel was scattered by the Assyrians and the southern kingdom of Judah was exiled by Babylon. And now there's a new world power on the stage and that is Persia. And Persia is ruling over the Jewish people as they are scattered around um, those different nations. Now, under the Persian ruler Cyrus, he allowed the Jews to return back to their homeland. And a lot of Jews chose to do that. But there was also a population of Jewish people who chose to stay in the foreign lands. So as Esther introduces us to the times of King Xerxes, we can expect that there is a small population of Jewish people living in the minority in Persia. Now, verse 4 tells us that for a full 180 days, he, King Xerxes, displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. For 180 days, for a full six months, King Xerxes held a party. That sounds exhausting. And this 180-day festival was all about celebrating King Xerxes, displaying and showing off arrogantly and pridefully in a narcissistic way his wealth and his splendor and his glory. And as you can imagine, this is a recipe for disaster. And by the end of this festival, King Xerxes is so drunk from wine in verse 10 that he requests that his queen, Vashti, be brought out so that all the nobles can admire her beauty. And what we learn in verse 12 is that Queen Vashti refuses to come out of her room. She refuses to obey the king's order and the king becomes furious. 
so mad that he decides that Queen Vashti is never again allowed to enter into his presence. And then he decides that her royal position would be given to someone else who is better than she. In the first 19 verses of Esther, King Xerxes has deposed his own wife, Queen Vashti, from the throne. And it creates this need to search for a new queen. And it was decided that all of the beautiful young virgin women in every province of his realm would be gathered, given beauty treatments. And chapter 2, verse 4, the young woman who pleases the king would be queen instead of Vashti. Now, can you believe that this is scripture here? Like, it kind of sounds a little bit more like Shrek, maybe, but this is, this is what God's word says. There's a need for a queen, and it is at this point of the story that we are finally introduced to two Jewish people living in Susa. Esther chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, say, Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jerohokin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Two Jewish people living in Persia at the time are Mordecai and Esther. Now, in these scriptures that we looked at, this is a good example where we're not sure how accurate the translation of, it, it, of being cousins. Some scholars seem to think that Mordecai is actually Esther's uncle, but what we do know for certain is that Mordecai and Esther are related in some way. And when Esther lost both of her parents, Mordecai took her in and raised her as his own. And because Esther fits the description of this beauty pageant that King Xerxes is throwing, Esther was brought to the king and she pleased him and won his favor. Now we have to remember that Esther is her Persian name because her cousin Mordecai had given her a very important piece of instruction and that was to not reveal her nationality and family background to anyone. In other words, tell no one that you are a Jew. And following this advice, Esther chapter 2, verse 15, Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her, including the king, who in chapter 2, verse 17, he sets a royal crown on her head and made her Esther queen instead of Vashti. Now, even though the book of Esther does not directly mention God, the author clearly wanted readers to search and look for and explore the ways that God was still at work, the way that he is still on every page of this story. And in that sense, maybe, just maybe, this is a brilliant literary technique brought to us by the author. Because maybe the author is trying to make a point that even when God seems absent, even when it feels like we're living in the shadows and we can't see God's direction and light, that we can trust that God is still at work. Hopefully you've already seen that because this story is full of what the world calls coincidences, but we know for certain that there is no such thing as random chance, that there's only God, God appointed, God, God's divine appointments. So as we work through this story of Esther, we will learn three important truths about God. The first is that God is a giver of opportunities. 
See, even in Persia, in this transition from one queen to the next, in in this world power, God wanted to use even that to demonstrate his care and sovereignty, his perfect control over his people and the world. He rose up this Jewish woman who had no parents and had no name in this great nation. He rose her up to become queen of Persia. God is the God of opportunities. It reminds me that when I was a high school student, Pastor Eric was my pastor. And I'll never forget on a random Wednesday night, he was preaching and he said, everything that you experience, God wants to use to give him glory and to make you look more like him. And that perspective changed my life. Because I started to understand that everything that I experience, every position that I find myself in, is a divine appointment from God. That means when you are going into work for another mundane Monday, that when that neighbor moves in next door, that person who you sit next to in class, the person who you talk with in the grocery line, none of those things are accidents. God wants to use them as opportunities. And that includes the hard things of our lives. Almost a couple years ago now, there was one weekend where my sweet grandpa fell very ill. And it was the same weekend that my mom went to the hospital unexpectedly for a mini stroke. And that was such a confusing and and stressful weekend. But because I had that perspective, that conviction that God wanted to use everything that I experienced for his glory and to make me more like him, I had hope that even that awful weekend was an opportunity given by God. And even though that weekend my grandpa passed away and went home to be with the Lord, One of the ways that we saw God work from that weekend is that was the catalyst for my mom to decide to retire. And because she retired early, a few months later, we found out that one of her cousins fell very ill with aggressive cancer. But because my mom had the flexibility of her schedule and her responsibilities, she was able to go on a weekly basis to her cousin and his family and care for them, to help them, to literally be the hands and feet of Jesus for them, all because she had that opportunity. That is how we saw God use even that difficult weekend. But how can we trust that God is even using those hard things for his glory and to make us more like him? Well, we know that because the Lord wants and is deserving of glory. I love what Psalm chapter 46 verse 10 has to say, where he, God, says, Be still and know that I am God. But sometimes I think we just stop at that part of the verse and we, we stop reading here. When, when, we, when we do that, we miss out on a whole second half of scripture and we miss out on, I think, the most encouraging part of it. And that is that God says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There is no condition here. There is no maybe. God will be worshiped and exalted on this earth. We can be sure of that. His purposes will be established. And he gives us opportunities to experience and participate in what he's doing in the world. And we would be so foolish to be ignorant or even choose to ignore the opportunities that he's given us. Now, if this were a Disney movie, the story of Esther would end here with her becoming queen and a big giant, and they lived happily ever after. But this is no Disney movie. This is not Shrek, and we are not even halfway through this story, let alone the whole Bible. And because God is giving Esther the opportunity to be queen, the story is just beginning. 
And the plot actually intensifies in Esther chapter 3, verse 1, where we are introduced to a man named Haman, who is someone who King Xerxes rises up and gives him a seat of honor that is higher than that of all the other nobles. And we learn in verse 2 that all the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. In verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Now remember, Mordecai is the man who raised Esther as his own child, and he is choosing not to bow down to this man, and Haman's blood is boiling. And you can remember who Haman is really easily in the story because his name really sounds like, hey man, that is not cool what you are doing. This is really not kind of you. This is not good. In fact, this is so serious. This is so serious because Haman is interested in killing not just Mordecai, not just one person, but an entire people group. In verse 8, Haman says to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among all the peoples in the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agadite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Do you see the sin that is hatred? That Haman's hatred sparked suspicion, fear, and lies about an entire people group who he didn't even know, but just by association, hating Mordecai led him to wanting all of their death. And a lack of love that we see in Haman, that is spiritual death. That's why it's sinful. And remember that the Jews here, they're a minority group living in Persia. So they are vulnerable, easy to pick on. But these customs that that Haman is warning King Xerxes of, remember that those customs aren't meant to be suspicious. They are meant to be holy. That they were given to the people by God in order to help them be different, in order to help them be different from the world and holy, set apart for God. And Haman is trying to use those holy customs now against the Jews. And the king, by giving his signet ring to Haman, everyone reading would have known that that was the seal of executive power. That that ring meant that there was no going back. What the king said cannot be revoked. All the Jews would be destroyed. And this is awful. This is painful. Any hope of salvation would have been diminished. Finding a way out of this seemed impossible. And that's exactly how Mordecai felt. In Esther chapter 4 verse 1, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, which were customary of mourning in his culture, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. In fact, verse 3, when all in every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning and fasting among the Jews. Weeping and wailing, many lay in sackcloth in ashes." And when Esther learns of Mordecai's distress, a messenger helps them to communicate. 
And Mordecai informs Esther of Haman's plot, and he makes this wild request of Esther. In chapter 4, verse 8, he tells Esther to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Remember that this is the same Mordecai who told Esther, do not tell anyone that you are a Jew. He is saying, put your life on the line, reveal your true identity, and ask for help for our people. And at this point, we are all so curious, what will be Queen Esther's response? Well, in chapter 4, verse 10, Esther instructs to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. At first, Esther is afraid, and rightfully so. Her life is on the line. Going to the king without being summoned was punishable by death. But in chapter 4, verse 12, when Mordecai learns of Esther's words, he says back to her, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. The second truth that we learn about God in Esther's story is that God doesn't need us to fulfill his plans. Instead, he invites us to be a part of his plans with him. Now, please hear me clearly. You are designed on purpose with a unique purpose, that you are God's handcrafted, lovingly made masterpiece created for good works that you might walk in them. But God doesn't need us because he is God. He created us just because he loves us and he just wants us. And he invites us to be a part of what he's doing. I went to um, a big public secular school for my undergraduate education. And when I was heading to campus, I honestly was really fired up because I felt like God called me to that campus, not just to get an education, but to be a missionary, to share his gospel with people who didn't know it yet. So I got to campus so excited, so ready to meet people and share the gospel. And I thought, man, this whole campus is going to come to Christ because I'm here. But as I got to campus, if, you have, if you're familiar with all the clubs being lined up together, I started walking all the clubs, and I realized that half of the clubs on campus were Christian organizations, and that there were already people in those organizations who were sharing the gospel right then and there with students. My pride was humbled so quickly, and I couldn't help but laugh a little because I had thought that God had sent me to this campus to share his gospel. But when I got there, I realized that he was already there. He was already moving. He was already working. And he was just inviting me to come be a part of what he was doing. You do have a part to play in God's story. But don't believe for a second that God's ultimate purposes won't be accomplished without you. 
Remember Psalm 46, God will be exalted among the nations. And that God who will be worshiped and will be lifted high, his gracious invitation to you and to me and to everyone everywhere is to come be a part of what he's doing. And it will take surrender and obedience on our part. But then we get a backstage pass into God's great plans of deliverance for the whole world. And that is what Esther got to experience. Strengthened by God, as her and so many others are fasting for her, she decides to appear before the king. And I can imagine as she's approaching the inner court that every nerve in her body is tingling, that her heart is racing because she knows what's at stake. It's her very life. And as she stands at the edge of the inner court, all of us hold our breath, wondering how King Xerxes will respond to her approaching. And we read in Esther chapter 5, verse 2, that when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her. And he held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. And here, Esther requests that the king and Haman join her for a banquet that she had prepared. And at that banquet, she invites them to another banquet. And there the king asks Esther a very similar question. And she responds, chapter 7, verse 3. If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. And, queen, and King Xerxes answered Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. And imagine the queen and the king and Haman all sitting together when this happens. And Esther says, an adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Haman is immediately stripped of his noble title. And Esther asks the king to release another edict that would overrule the one that ordered the destruction of the Jews. In chapter 8, verse 6, she says, For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? And as punishment, Haman received the death that he had wanted Mordecai and the Jews to face. And the king released a new edict that gave all the Jews the right to assemble and to protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them. And he sealed that edict with his signet ring, reminding us, Esther chapter 8, verse 8, that no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. And this day of deliverance for the Jews became a day to be remembered. Remember, the legacy of the story of Esther is the festival of Purim. And Purim comes from this Hebrew word, pur, which means lot. And Haman had actually used lots. He cast them, kind of rolled the dice in a sense, to, in order for chance to decide when the Jews would face destruction. And one of the ironic reversals of this story is that the very thing that Haman tried to use to destroy the Jews, it's now the title of their festival of celebration. Because the salvation of God's people was never up to chance. That he would always come through for them. He was in control the entire time. And that's the third truth that we learn about God. That God protects 
his people. Mordecai was certain that deliverance would come from the Jews. And even though he did not mention God specifically, we can infer that as a Jew who would not bow down to a man, that as a Jew who wept and mourned and fasted at the news of their destruction, that it was Mordecai's faith in God that gave him the resolve to trust the Lord's plans. And in fact, that's what they celebrate annually at the Festival of Purim. Esther chapter 9, verses 21 and 22. This is when they celebrate the time the Jews got relief from their enemies. And as the month when their sorrow was turned to joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. God had protected and saved his people. This is the story of Esther. And as we've been studying together all year as a Purpose Church family, Jesus is on every page of the Bible, and he is all over the book of Esther. And one of the clearest ways we see that is seeing how Esther, in so many ways, was an advocate. She entered into the king's court on behalf of her people. They needed saving, and she asked him for help on their behalf. And scripture defines Jesus as our advocate. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 say, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word advocate in 1 John, in the original Greek, is this word parakletos. And it means called alongside, called to one's aid, somebody summoned to the assistance of another. And that is exactly what Queen Esther did for her people. She saw that they were in trouble. And as queen, she probably held some power, but she chose to follow the normal protocol of her day and approach the king in order to make her request. And for Jesus, being fully man, but also fully God, he held all the power, but he did not use his power to avoid the cross. Instead, he humbly submitted to the father's ways and plans and will. The Jewish people in Esther's day were facing hatred and death. And Jesus can relate to that. Jesus faced hatred so much so that religious and government leaders put him to death on a cross, wrongfully so. And Esther did not let her fear of death stop her from advocating for her people. Instead, their pain was actually her motivation to be their advocate. Remember what she said, how can I see my family come to destruction? And even more significantly, in an even more powerful way, that is how Jesus felt for all of us. Because Jesus stood in the gap. He saw that our sin had separated us from him. And he saw the fate that we deserved. And he said, how can I bear to see my children face that fate? How could I see them face destruction? And so he came to earth, fully God, fully man, lived the perfect life that you and I never could. So when he was wrongly put to death on the cross, he was the perfect sacrifice that paid the debt that we owed. So that three days later, when he rose from the grave, Jesus could rise and be our divine, our perfect, our holy advocate. That says to the enemy, our accuser, there is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is written. It is finished. Nothing could separate us again because of my love for them. And Jesus, our advocate, says to the Father, even though our people sinned against us, I came to be their perfect sacrifice so that once again I can advocate for them so that they can experience eternal life in right relationship with us if they just believe in us 
and follow us. That is the good news of the gospel. And that is what Christians get to celebrate every single day. And that is what we are going to celebrate really big in just a couple of weeks. Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. We've seen together in Esther that God is a giver of opportunities and that he always comes to protect and rescue his people. And God doesn't need us but he invites us to be a part of his plans with him. And so I want to challenge you now to take a few minutes and respond. Because God may not be asking you to save an entire people group like he asked Esther to do, but I don't think that we can honestly read this scripture and not consider the the opportunities that God is giving us in the unique positions that he's placed us in. You see, maybe God is asking you to serve somewhere. Maybe God is asking you to give to someone or to something. Maybe God is asking you to apologize to someone who you hurt or to forgive someone who hurt you or to accept God's forgiveness for you for the first time. And as we talk about for such a time as this, it is no coincidence that we study the book of Esther just two weeks before Easter Sunday. Because maybe God is encouraging you to go online and download our Easter service invitation so that you can invite that neighbor or that coworker to come hear the gospel so that they might know Jesus. Maybe you have never been baptized before and God is asking you to go public with your faith after one of our services on Easter Sunday. Right after this, because I want us to respond, I want you to have a conversation with God and with others. And your conversation with God is very simple. You ask him, Lord, what is one way you are asking me to be obedient to you? And then you stay silent and you wait and listen for his answer. And then you open up this conversation with others so that you can share with other people what God has put on your heart. They can share what God has put on theirs. And together you can ask, how can you support each other as you both take these next steps with him? Whatever God's answer is, to the one way he's asking you to be obedient to him. That is your next step. And as you consider whether or not you will choose to praise him with your obedience, whether or not you will actually take your next step, I want you and us to remember Mordecai's words in Esther chapter 4. If you remain silent at this time, if you choose not to take an obedient step of faith, God's relief and deliverance will still come for the world. But who knows if God has placed you where you're at in the position that you're in, with the influence you have, with the opportunities that he's given you and asked you to be obedient for such a time as this. Hey Purpose Church, I'm Tamiko and I'm your Justice Ministries Pastor. I just want to thank you again for joining our online community. And remember to visit our website, follow our social media, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure to click the bell icon to receive notifications throughout the week. I hope to see you in person or here online again soon.